Hello everyone, welcome to another episode of the Creepy Fox Podcast. This is the show in the series where we go ahead and relive and retell scary stories that have been shared by subscribers such as yourself. We got another good one for you all today, as we'll be covering a topic that we only cover once a year, unexplained scary stories. I really enjoy these sorts of scary stories as they go beyond the typical sorts of scary experiences we cover, the sorts of experiences that keep you up at night. So, as you sit back and relax, and enjoy these two hours of stories, make sure that if you do have a story you like to submit, you do so by submitting it to my user submissions email. You can find it on screen on all my videos. It's tcfnarrations at gmail.com. I'd love to feature you. Anyways, friends, let's go ahead and get started with today's episode. Enjoy. This happened about two years ago in mid-November. I'm from Finland, and as most Finnish men, I serve in the military. Every year, I leave for anywhere from two to seven weeks for training and basic drills. I'm about the Finnish equivalent ranked a corporal, so there's a few soldiers I command in the unit. Our unit was 16 soldiers, including me, which is really small. We were stationed in the far north in Lapland, which is basically nothing but cold tundra and forests. It was snowing pretty hard one night when my squad and I were performing our usual exercises. We had been there for about four days. On that one particular night, we had gone out to explore and left our small command center where the rest of the soldiers and officers were. It was myself and five others. We must have hiked about three or four kilometers to a part of the forest where we practiced shooting and all that. There is a small trail off to the side of the target shacks. We decided to follow it through where we reached a fork in the road. We split up and went through the roads. On the left side my group took, there was an old abandoned warehouse that must have been there for years. It was obviously deserted and probably had been for some time because it looked like it was ready to collapse. We went into it and we looked around a bit. There was a blown out window near the end of the back entrance. I looked through it and I could see all the forests and the lake near the warehouse. But then something caught my eye. Something I'll never forget. On the edge of the water was a woman on her knees knelt over the lake. She had blood all over her chest and legs. She sat there splashing water on herself trying to wash off the blood. She then lifted her head up and I saw her face. She sat there with a cold grin almost like she was laughing. She looked up at the warehouse and she spotted me. She then stood up and started walking back into the woods. When she turned around, that's when I noticed the handle of something sticking out of her pants. It was definitely the handle of a knife. Instantly I called for the others to come and I told them about what happened. I'm sure they probably thought I was full of it, but I know what I saw. I was honestly scared out of my mind, but I knew that as a soldier, we needed to help her if she was injured. Besides, I had others with me and we had our rifles, so I felt a little bit safer going into the woods to look for a deranged woman with a possible weapon. We found a part of the river that was pretty shallow and we stepped through it to the other side of the forest. We then sent a radio message to the others telling them to meet us by the forest. After a few minutes of waiting, they finally regrouped and I told them I had seen a woman enter the forest. We then split up again into three groups of two. We searched the forest for about 15 minutes before I heard a shot get fired. We ran toward the sound until we met up with the other groups. One of the soldiers had fired an alert shot so we could go find him. What is it? I said as he pointed in front of him. There about five feet from me was a pile of bloody clothes next to a tree. In the tree was a dagger that had been plunged into it. After that, we went back to base. We didn't really talk about it much, but it always bothered and haunted me just thinking about it. Since then, I've still been serving in the army, and I've been even deployed to peacekeeping missions where I've been shot at. Nothing has ever haunted me more in my life than that woman's face. Now she smiled as she washed blood off her clothes. This happened about two and a half years ago. I'm a 36-year-old male and I live in South Florida. To give you an idea why this is out of place for me, everything around me is very urban and fast-paced. So, as you can imagine, nothing really creepy really happens here. 
but when it does, most here are quick to dismiss any weird happenings. My wife is a social worker for a hospice company. She has creepy stuff happen all the time at work. I'm sure everyone knows what hospice is, so I won't get into it. When it's her turn to be on call, I always ready myself to drive her to any call she might get. She can get calls for hospice at any time of night. As a husband, I feel it's my duty to protect my wife any way I can, so I've given myself the job title of head of security over her when she's called to go out. Most of the calls are usually at hospitals or condominiums, but very few homes. I drive her to her destinations and keep watch over her until she enters. I spend most of the time watching Netflix, catching up on episodes I'm currently binge-watching. So one night around 9 o'clock, she gets a call. The resident nurse lets my wife know that her patient had passed. The family requested a social worker. Since she's on call, we have to go. This is nothing unusual, so we begin to head out. We drove about 20 minutes south into an urban suburb. Nice homes, lawns, and clean looking. I'm just so happy that she's not called into some slum. We find the house and pull into the driveway. My wife makes her usual calls to the funeral home and others before heading in. You know, to get the ball rolling. It can take the funeral home a while to get there and remove the body. Plus, we have our son with his grandmother and he was only a few months old at the time. So we were hoping not to be out too long. And it was already a little after 10pm at this point, on a weeknight. I noticed a few people driving up. They were family members who wanted to say goodbye to the woman that had passed. Some went to the front door, others through the open garage. It was nothing unusual. After a few minutes, my wife got all the paperwork needed and kissed me and went inside. So I whip out my headphones and continue the show I was binge-watching at the time. It was X-Files. Yeah, yeah, I know. But before I continue, I'm not one of those people that get freaked out so easily just because I'm watching something like that. I'm a big guy, a former bouncer, and can protect myself pretty well. So my mindset is not jumpy at all. So I'm about 30 minutes into the episode, and all the while I would pop my head up at any movement. For one, to survey the types of people entering the house, and two, just to see if my wife was coming out, and also to be on a lookout for the funeral home van. After a while, the flow of people coming and going had slowed down, so I wasn't looking up so much. But then something caught my attention. I looked up from my phone and towards the front door of the house. It's going to be hard to explain what I saw next, so please bear with me. It was a dark mass. It looked like a shadow, but denser. It was a formless form, but I can tell. It was moving towards the door of the house, but by the time I could understand what I was looking at, it started to dissolve upward or blow away like leaves. It was freaky. I'm looking at this happen in front of me, but my brain was having a hard time processing what I was looking at. It was so foreign. The whole thing lasted about five or seven seconds. By the time I had realized what I was looking at, it was gone. So I looked into the direction that it dissolved slash blew away to, and I saw nothing. Then I shrugged it off and went back to my show. Maybe the shadow from the trees, I thought. A few seconds later, more movement at the front door. It opens and this lady popped her head out. She looked left and right, and then she shut the door. I looked at her and around the entrance, and back down to my show. After a while, I looked up again. It's my wife walking from the open garage. She gets in and I say, You ready? She says no, still waiting on the funeral home to show up. She was a little frustrated seeing how she called them nearly an hour ago. So I ask how was the family taking the loss and how she was feeling. She talks about the mood of the family, how they were coping well when she first got there. Then the whole mood changed after something creepy happens. My eyebrows go up. Creepy? I asked. I had something creepy happen too. So I asked her to go first. She said that she was talking with the deceased lady's daughter when they hear a loud knock at the front door. They all thought it was strange because everybody who was coming in just let themselves in. Plus this knock was really loud and strong. So her daughter went over to ask who it was but got no answer. She opens up the door and looked out but she didn't see anyone. So she closed the door, shrugged her shoulders, and walked back to my wife. And that's when the whole mood changed. A cold feeling came across the room they were in. It was very saddening, kind of hopeless, as it fell on the room. 
very draining, she said. My wife says she felt a strange presence in the house after that. Not too long after that happened, since everything was odd, she decided to come outside for a few minutes and see how I was doing. My eyes widened while she was talking. She looked at me and said, What? What happened to you? You said something creepy happened to you. Tell me. And then I asked her, Did her daughter have a ponytail and glasses, wearing a white shirt? She said, Yeah. Why, did you see her when she looked out? That's when I began to tell her what I saw and what I experienced. We both sat there with this look of amazement on our faces. For a few seconds we sat completely silent and we looked around. I'm a God-fearing man. I have a firm belief in the afterlife. I also believe entities other than humans can take advantage of a situation, like the passing of a family member or something like that. I think this thing came to feed off the grief of this family seeing how the mood changed in the house. Unknowingly, they let this entity in. We've both decided to pray for protection, not wanting this thing to follow us home, and she made a call to find out the ETA of the funeral home. They were ten minutes away. My wife is used to this feeling. However, this was the first time she had an apparition, and an audible knock to go with it. She waited a few more minutes before going back in. Not long after she went in, I saw the lights of the funeral home van. By this time, it was a little after 11 p.m. Two heavyset men in cheap suits get out and pull the stretcher out of the back of the van. They go in and emerge ten minutes later with the body covered with a sheet. My wife was right behind them. She came straight to the car. I say again, You ready? Yes, she said with a sigh of relief. So I scan the area as we back out, hoping not to see anything else. We reached our home and all was well. I've gone to plenty more calls since that night, and I haven't seen or experienced anything like that ever again. But I can't help but think how often something like that can enter your home and alter the mood just like that, or worse. Me being a former bouncer, I thought to myself, how in the world do you keep something like that out? This story is set in the 90s. I was about 9 or 10. It was a week on which I didn't have school and it was kinda cold outside. I used to play with my neighbor across the street and we grew up in the same school district. I was bored and I asked my mom if I could go play with them and she allowed it. Usually we played football in the yard across the road from our two houses and our siblings would split into two groups. But today was a different day. When I walked over to see if he was home, his parents told me he was at a cousin's house with his older brother. I knew where that was, so I told my mom that's where I was heading. It was only about 10 minutes across town on a slow walk, but I decided to take my bicycle. I didn't realize it until I thought more about it that they were out hunting all morning. It was a little afternoon. I should tell you that this town is only about 2,000 people, and everybody knows everyone. Well, when I arrived, they are watching the Raiders game, and I was a big fan back then. It was about over and I waited for it to end and asked him if he wanted to go play football. He said no, but suggested that we go back out into a small stretch of trees to hunt some squirrel. I agreed and we got dressed to be out for a bit. We walked out back and we began to search for the nests and any squirrels that might be gathering for nuts. We didn't see any right away. We walked a bit further until we reached the road down from the tree line. I had seen a car drive by but didn't think much about it. We crossed the street and walked into a small field surrounded by individual trees. We walked down one side and saw one squirrel, but my friend missed with his 22. We then walked across the small field to the other set of trees and he shot a couple of nests, but nothing was in them. We walked to the end of the field and he says, Let's go home and warm up. I agreed since it was pretty uneventful to say the least. By this time we were walking towards the middle of the field from the barbed wire fence when the same car pulled up on the road and stopped. My friend says, Looks like my cousin. What's he doing? The man resembled him and he had the same kind of car. When the man got out, we stopped in our tracks when he opened up his car trunk. He pulled out a shotgun and began to aim toward us. We started to run back toward the barbed wire fence. The man began to fire. As we ran and heard the bullets missing us by inches, I felt as if it was a prank but was still scared. As we neared the fence, my friend held it open as I dove through. He then tossed his twenty-two beside me and dove through as well. We ducked behind a rock and hid until the shooting stopped. 
We then looked over the rock and saw the man putting his gun on his trunk and getting back in his car. After he speeds away, we got out of there. When we reached his cousin's home, we asked him why he was shooting at us and why he would do that. My friend's brother was there and he and their cousin both said, We were here the whole time cooking up the deer meat for chili. We told them what happened and they said it wasn't them. To this day, we still don't know who it was or why they were shooting at us. But one thing is for certain, we didn't want to go back in that field. We still talk about it when we remember it, but we don't go back. Hey there, I've been watching slash listening to your channel for some time and I just now got the courage to tell you my weird encounter while in the woods. So here it goes. I'm 19 years old now, but it was a year ago when this happened. It was early spring and I was with my 12 year old cousin. We'll call her Ash. Ash and I were the very athletic woodsy type, so you can imagine that we both enjoyed the outdoors. I should mention that my cousin lived with my nana and papa. My nana and papa live out in the countryside, where they have a large backyard and wooded area. Even though my nana and papa live in the country, they still had close neighbors, about five minutes away from their home. This will come into play later in the story. Anyways, it was late spring as I stated earlier, and Ash and I wanted to go into the woods. We both put on our jeans and waterproof boots, and we tell our Nana that we were heading that way. My Nana said, Okay honey, just be sure not to go too far in. We're supposed to get a storm a little bit later today. Be safe, and don't forget your emergency flashlights and pepper spray. I should mention that we always pack stuff as if we're going camping, just in case we did get lost. So her little talk about bringing lights and stuff wasn't out of the normal for us. Not that we would get lost. The area is extremely familiar to my cousin and I. Fast forward to about an hour, and Ash and I were on a trail we both made ourselves. We know the area so well because every time I go to my Nana's, we both go to the woods. Anyways, we're both walking, and this was when we noticed something we've both never seen before. A little cabin-like structure. As I said earlier, Ash and I know the woods and this little cabin was not there the last time we went out there. Curious, my cousin takes my hand and wants to go see the cabin. I figured, hey, let's have a little bit of excitement for once and see what's in there. Not even three steps in, I heard the cracking of branches. I immediately stopped my cousin and looked in the area of the noise. We both get down as I notice a very tall figure, who I assumed was a man, wearing what looked like a trench coat. My cousin was terrified, and I tried to stay brave for her sake. The man goes over to the cabin and goes in for a while. I take my cousin by the hand, and slowly try to make our way back to the trail. That was my first mistake. Since it was early spring, all the dead branches and leaves were on the ground, hence how I could hear the man. Well, Ash steps on a large branch and breaks it, making a loud cracking noise. Just then, I hear loud footsteps from the cabin and the man rushes out of it, going in our direction. Ash screams, and I pick her up, running towards the trail that goes to my Nana's place. I realized that the man was faster than us, and I thought, what if he makes it to my Nana's house? They're both elderly, and there's no way they could fend for us. I knew I had pepper spray, but that wouldn't do much good with the wind blowing my way. So I make a detour. Just then, it starts downpouring and thundering. I took this as a vantage point, mostly because the visibility was about 10 feet. I rush us into a large berry bush, and we hide. I hear the footsteps come to a stop, but it was so hard to listen in, mostly because of how hard the rain was falling. That's when I noticed that we were at the edge of the woods. Remember how I said that my Nana's neighbors were about 5 minutes away? Through the opening, I can barely see the neighbor's house. We were basically in their backyard. Without thinking, I grab my cousin and book it. We see the neighbor's boy, who was about 20, and we get his attention. Ash and I are completely soaked by this point, and she's sobbing in my arms. The man never did notice us, thankfully, so we made it there safely. We call the police, and they make it to the neighbor's house in record time. They search the woods, but sadly, they couldn't find anything. We did wait for the rain to stop before we decide to show them where the cabin was. But when we got there, it was gone. Completely. What looked like dragging tracks was the only thing left in place. Well, regardless, I was in shock, as the police called it in. 
Looking back at this, I wondered something. Every time Ash and I went into the woods, we never encountered something with such a malicious attitude. Even the animals were docile. My cousin recalled the time that she went into those woods alone. She remembered hearing noises, but never something that would worry her. In the end, the police never found the man, and my cousin and I won't go into those woods without a weapon. It didn't really ruin our woodsy-like nature, but it did make us more cautious and aware of our surroundings. I was about 14 and I was looking for money to buy some chips at a gas station. I had worked at my mom's preschool before and I enjoyed being with kids. So I decided that I would start a babysitting business and I put up some posters. This was around the time of the clown sightings of 2016 in Wrightwood, California, a small town in the mountains. I finally got a job babysitting a three-year-old boy. When I got there, me and the parents talked about bedtimes and allergies, the normal stuff. When they were done explaining, they left and told me they'd be back at around 8 p.m. I waved goodbye and then I turned to the young boy to ask him what he wanted to do. He smiled and said, I want to draw. So I got into my backpack, in which I had packed a lot of books and art stuff. We sat down at the table and he started to draw with some crayons and I absentmindedly sketched some trees, probably thinking about my crush or something. The kid handed me a picture that he drew. It was a clown. He said that it was a clown that visits him at night. I thought he was just talking about having dreams about clowns. I smiled and said, Oh, so cute. It was still light out, so I took him outside to jump on the trampoline. He jumped and tumbled around as I watched and giggled. It then started to get dark, and I took him inside, holding him on my hip. We read a book, and he ended up falling asleep on my lap. Now I take him upstairs and put him in his tiny red car bed. Then I went back downstairs to watch some TV and do my homework. I was just relaxing, eating the snacks from my backpack. Then I hear something outside. I did brush it off as a raccoon or a squirrel, but then I recognized the sound. It was the trampoline. Now this was a small town, so I just thought it was some kids jumping on the trampoline. I decided I would go check it out anyway. I went outside thinking I would just tell the kids to get off the trampoline, and then I realized that it was actually darker outside than I originally thought it was. I walked over to the trampoline, and then the next thing that I know, my blood ran cold, and I wished that it was only a couple of kids having fun. I saw a clown with a super creepy mask. It had this inhuman smile on it, a big red afro too. I remember I gasped and tried to be quiet while walking back into the house. I got in without making any noise. I locked the deadbolt and stood in front of the door with a kitchen knife, ready for the clown if he came in. Then, I heard a loud bang upstairs. Oh no, I thought. He broke into the window. I ran upstairs and then saw the clown in the three-year-old's bedroom. I could see the three-year-old talking to the clown, and the clown was trying to convince him to run away and come with him. Then I understood his drawing of the clown who visits him. I quickly called 911 without him hearing me and screamed, You better get out before the police get here. The clown looked at me and then screamed, an inhuman scream I should add, and then jumped out the window. I looked outside to see him running away. It's not possible though, I thought, for this was the second floor and you couldn't run away without being injured. My heart rate it was super high which isn't good for somebody like me with pre-diabetes. I was honestly so scared, the police arrived a few minutes later and investigated. I fainted at this time and must have been out for a while, because I ended up waking up in the hospital. They explained how I had fainted. After that, I was so scared of clowns, that whenever I saw one or heard any noises in my home, I feared for my safety. I have had some other creepy encounters before, but this was by far the scariest. For as long as I can remember, there's been something, an entity perhaps, that has been following my family around from house to house. At first it was small things, such as the feeling of being watched or faint footsteps, but over the years it got worse. I have encounters from myself, my sister, and my brother. Let me tell you our first encounter. In 2009. When we moved to states, we lived in a condominium, 
It was in a nice neighborhood, but I still felt uncomfortable being home alone. I just always felt like I was being watched. Every Saturday, my parents would leave us home alone on Saturday nights because of work, so my sister and I would sleep in their room while my brother slept on the couch. We normally went to sleep pretty early, so I was fast asleep by 9. The next thing I know, I woke up, and I look at the clock, and it was midnight. As I looked at the clock, I noticed there was something standing over my sister and I. He was tall, and had long skinny fingers, with the lengthiest fingernails I'd ever seen. His eyes were bright red, and he had a sharp hunchback which made him that much more creepier. I know it wasn't sleep paralysis, because I was able to cover my head with the blanket right away and force myself to go back to sleep. I told my parents about it, but of course they told me it wasn't real. I believed them up until the same thing happened to my sister a couple of months later, but worse. It was a Friday night, so my sister, brother, and I fell asleep in the living room as we were watching TV. All of a sudden, my sister woke up to a loud crash in the kitchen, although the cabinets and the drawers were opening and closing by themselves. It was so loud she didn't even know what to do, so instead she flipped over to her side facing our patio, and what do you know? There he is, the same exact man hunching over my brother's body. When my sister made eye contact with him, he smiled, and with that creepy smile she could see his sharp and bright white teeth. It was the most chilling thing I'd ever seen. As he was grinning at her, he lifted up his sharp claw-like hands over my brother. The banging in the kitchen got louder, and the blinds on our windows began to shake. And with that, he was gone. Everything fell silent and the only noise that was made for the rest of the night were the blinds moving back and forth, as if somebody had opened and closed them. My parents didn't believe her, but I sure did, because I knew I saw the same thing. From then on, everything was normal, until we moved into the house that was waiting for us after we moved out of the condominium. The house we moved into was nice, but of course I still felt shaken up every time I had to be there alone. At first, everything was fine. But then one day my dog was eating his dinner, and next thing we know his bowl was pulled out from right under him. Flash forward to today and he still hesitates eating out of his bowl. Nothing too major happened after that, so I'll flash forward to 2011. My sister was having a sleepover with her friend and they decided to sleep in the living room since I shared the room with my sister at the time, and she didn't want her lame younger sister hanging out with them. They ended up falling asleep on the couch, and that was that. The next day, her friend said, Hey, was your brother up last night, around one in the morning? My sister replied with, Uh, not that I know of. He spends a lot of time in his room. The next thing, her friend said, still haunts me to this day. I just thought I saw a 1960s-like man with a top hat on. He wasn't doing anything. He was just staring at us from your room door. We decided not to tell our parents about that since we didn't want them to think we were crazy. Nothing happened after that, except one of my dad's infamous ghost stories. So here it is. In the winter of 2012, we all traveled to Coachella, California for a horse show. My parents work with horses and my sister and I ride and compete. The first couple of days we were there, all we heard about was La Llorona. You've probably heard of her, but at the time I hadn't. All of the workers there were talking about her. Now this is one of the most popular places to see her. My parents told us not to believe them as it was just an urban legend. But that following morning, my dad witnessed something he had never seen before. My parents were up at 3.30 a.m. because that's when they had to exercise the horses to get them ready for competition. So my dad took a horse out and took him to the arena that was across the fairgrounds. When he was wrapping everything up to go back to the main part of the grounds, a small cloud of mist floated over him, and there... Ten feet away from him stood a girl in a small white dress with her head down just crying. My dad tried talking to her, but she just kept crying. He felt that something wasn't right, so he closed his eyes and started praying. When he opened his eyes, he saw the girl had stopped crying and the same cloud of mist floated over again and the girl had disappeared. Everything up until this point seemed pretty innocent, like something was just trying to scare us. But everything changed on the night of 2013. A little bit of backstory. 
We had two puppies at the time, so my mom put cat collars on them so we could hear them in case they got lost. Keep that in mind as the story goes on. My sister was now a junior in high school, so her German class decided to take a trip to Leavenworth. For those of you who don't know, Leavenworth is a small German-like town in the state of Washington. It's super popular during the winter, since it snows and they have all those decorations up. Anyways, she wasn't supposed to come back until 8pm Sunday night, so my parents decided to take me along with them to a church event. At around 9pm, my mom gets a call from my sister and she's frantically screaming and crying. She was saying something like, Can you please come home now? There's someone in the house. And with that, my dad called our neighbors and we sped all the way home. So what exactly happened that night? Well, when my sister arrived home at around 8.30pm, she went straight to her room to Skype her boyfriend and tell him all about the trip. She had her door closed, by the way, so her dogs wouldn't bother her. Five minutes into the Skype call, she hears the TV turn on. It's blasting through the house. She leaves her room and she finds that it was turned all the way up. So she mutes it and turns the TV off and heads to her room. All of a sudden, she starts to hear this weird banging in the kitchen, which is right next to her room, and pans start to clack together, almost as if somebody themselves were banging them together. Drawers and cabinets start to open and close, like they did four years prior. Her boyfriend, still on Skype, says, Hey, is everything okay? She replies with, I, I don't know. And then out of nowhere, the TV turns on again, and there's knocking going on all around the house. She was frozen, and she didn't know what to do, and just as it began, it stopped, and she just listened. She heard a faint sound of the dog's collar coming up the hallway, so she stood up to go open the door for the dogs, and as she was about to open the door, she heard the bells jingling, as if somebody was holding them and just dangling them in front of the door to mess with her. She had enough with that. So she called my parents and they informed her that her neighbor would be there soon with his rifle. As we were pulling into the house, our neighbor called us to let us know that everything was okay. My dad didn't believe him, so we went in and right away we felt a cold chill come over us. But that wasn't the strange part. The strange part was that nothing was put out of place and nothing was taken. My laptop was still in our pool table and all of our valuables were still in place. My parents thought it was time that they'd believe us. So that same night, our church came over and prayed for our house. From there on, everything was normal, and we thought it was the end of it. Until we moved, yet again. My first encounter was in 2015. It was winter break, so I thought it would be fun to watch movies all night. At around 3am, I began to hear loud footsteps walking around the living room. I knew everybody was asleep. So I just ignored it and played it off as my imagination. But it wasn't. Because next thing I know there are footsteps walking down the stairs toward my room and my parents' room. But the footsteps stopped right in front of my door. I listened for what seemed like forever. And finally they walked back up the stairs and through the living room. After that, I heard nothing. I decided to ignore it and ask my family about it in the morning. What do you know? No one was awake at that hour just as I had guessed. After this, all we would hear were footsteps and voices, but nothing else. One day, my sister came home from work while my parents and I were out. She swore she heard my mom and I talking and laughing, but as she closed the door behind her, she heard us shushing each other, and that was it. Up until now, there have been two times when I would have to call my sister when she was out, or our neighbors when I was home alone, because I'm constantly hearing footsteps doors opening and closing, and finding doors open that I was sure had been closed. I don't know if there's much we can do because all this happens even with Bibles all over the house, and the constant praying that my parents in church do, but we have just chosen to ignore it, since an encounter only happens once every couple of months. Anyways, those were my stories. I hope you guys got a kick out of this, just as much as my friends did hearing it. This was almost a year ago now. It was late spring 2017. I have three dogs and since I have anxiety I don't really like a lot of people, especially in my house, so I never socialize them. They bark at every little thing. 
This was, however, not one of their normal fits. Now, I was home alone, which is perfectly normal, but this particular day I was waiting for my older sister to pick me up. I hate people knocking on the door, so I was waiting in my kitchen where I could see her pull up. That's when I heard a groan, and my dog started to absolutely lose it. Now, this wouldn't be the sort of noise a house makes, even though it was built in the 70s. This was more what you'd expect from someone who had hurt themselves and didn't want to scream. I'd never been in a situation where I thought there was an intruder in my house before. Well, as it turns out, I'm the type of person who grabs the nearest knife and goes searching through all the rooms in the house, even though I knew exactly which room it came from. It was the back bedroom. I use that room for storage, and I really hate going in there. The air is heavy, and you can feel a presence. It's just an overall bad vibe. When I got to that room, I really wanted to just get whatever was going to happen out of the way, so I swung the door open, with honestly a lot more force than I meant to. My dogs ran in and started legitimately attacking the walls. I looked around slowly, scanning the stacks of boxes that went from the floor to the ceiling. No open windows. No knocked over boxes. Nobody there. In that instant, I was ready to just run. I called my dogs, closed the door, and tried to stay calm while briskly walking to the front of my house. I decided to check my phone, and I quickly realized my sister was about 45 minutes late, which wasn't out of character for her, but I needed out of there. I decided I was going to wait outside for her, and I walked into the driveway of my house, closed my door behind me, calm as could be, while still shaking violently. And there she was. My sister was just there sitting in my driveway, not like she had just pulled in either. I got in the car, and she was very annoyed at telling me about how she'd waited 10 minutes for me. Now she'd just watched me absolutely lose my mind from the kitchen window, which you can see clearly into from the driveway. And that's when she called me multiple times. I was incredibly confused and scared until my phone started vibrating. I pulled it out to see 12 missed calls and 5 messages from her. I don't know how to explain any of this, but it's probably the scariest of all the incidents that I attribute to the ghost in my house. This email is referring to a scary story slash experience that I witnessed. Hi. I'm a 20-year-old female from Utah, and this happened about six years ago. My parents' sisters and I had moved into a house that we just built. I kind of believed in the paranormal, but after this experience, I'm a 100% believer. My oldest sister had always believed in the paranormal. She would always tell me about her experiences, and I never believed her. I'm the type of person to see it to believe it. I shared a room with my youngest sister, by the way. My bed sat closest to the closet and the bedroom door. That night, I just felt sick to my stomach. Every night before I go to sleep, I had to sleep with the TV on. It was a horrible habit for myself. I fell into a deep sleep. In my dream, I'd woken up and I looked at my TV and it was stuck on the static, making a loud, fuzzy noise. I noticed something standing by the TV. It was a little girl. I rubbed my eyes so I could get a better look she was just standing there. I couldn't see her face, but she had long black hair, and she was wearing a nightgown. I wanted to scream, but I couldn't force anything out. I forced myself to wake up, and I just sat up in my bed. I was terrified. I turned on my lamp and just sat there trying to wrap my mind around the whole thing, and I instantly felt uncomfortable. I just felt like someone was looking at me. But then I heard a weird whistle. I looked up, and my older sister's bedroom door was open. I just froze. I got the chills and heat flashes. A huge deformed shadow was moving by my older sister's bed. I kept quiet. I was so scared that this thing was going to see me. I remember I sunk into my bed covers and covered half my face, still staring at this shadow. The shadow started to walk. It got closer to the bedroom door. I could see it had long arms and long legs. It walked out of the room making its way into the hallway. This is when I noticed it had long fingers and nails. This thing was so big it had to scrunch down to get through the doorway. It had a hunchback and a long neck. It had no face. I remember the details in its arms and its body. It looked like a human, but it was too skinny I could see the details of its ribcage. I started to feel sick. I've never seen something so demonic or deformed. I told my mom the next morning and she's a very spiritual person. 
She also comes off as a smart aleck. She told me it was all the negative energy my sisters and I put out. For a week I would catch glimpses of this little girl I saw in my dream. I never felt threatened by her though. She looked innocent and scared. I saw her sitting on my back porch and walked downstairs into my basement and walk into my room. The last time I saw her I was in my kitchen doing the dishes. We had two big windows above the sink and you could see my neighbor's whole backyard. All of a sudden I got that feeling of somebody watching me again. I remember instantly I looked up and she was standing in my neighbor's lawn staring at me. I locked eyes with her. I felt so bad. I just wanted to cry as I felt pain. I wanted to help her. I remember I even got into protection mode. After all, I'm a mother and I get that way with my daughter. Tears started to come up. She then turned around and walked away as she just disappeared. To this day, I never saw the little girl again. I did experience more with the shadow though. There's just so much more that has happened. But if you want more, please let me know. So up until now, my life has been going fairly well. My friend has been getting better and I've been making stronger bonds with my family members. But that isn't what I'm talking about today. A few weeks back, I got a job at this movie theater here in my small town. It's not too big, just a small dining area and one showroom with a balcony. Anyways, my job was the nightman. Yeah, they thought some stranger would break in, I know. So I got the job. I worked from around 10 or 11 at night to about 9 a.m. the next day. It isn't so hard because I'm a night owl anyways. Plus, it's nearly double pay and I was the only one willing to take the responsibility. Every so often, the theater has special midnight reservations. Some were just small groups. One time I had a bus full of people to deal with. But they aren't what this story is about. Anyways, it was around midnight when two women, one tall and the other short, came in. They said they had a reservation. I looked down at the computer screen and I checked the list. But there weren't any reservations for that night. I then looked back up and I noticed they were gone. I nearly shouted when I realized it. What the heck? I whispered to myself. I decided that I must have been tired, but I was wrong. I got some soda from the machine on my side of the counter and I turned back around. The women are there again. They asked if they could get tickets. Now, I'm usually not supposed to let people get the tickets that late at night, but I didn't want to see these weird women. So I let them and they then went into the showroom. Thank God the projector was automated, otherwise I might have had a heart attack. I finished my soda and I went to check up on the people. But when I entered the showroom, there was no movie playing and they weren't there. I panicked and I ran out. I locked the front door and turned off the lights and went into my office in the back of the kitchen. Why? I asked myself again. There is no way they could have left. Well, I decided not to brush this off as tiredness. I sat down in the brightly lit office and turned on the old computer wire to the cameras. I then quickly checked the footage from the previous 20 minutes, but the women weren't there. The creepiest part? Neither was I. Oh God, I whisper. I turn the footage to the live feed as I hear glass shatter. I recall then switching to the dining area camera. They're standing in a pool of bloody glass shards were the two women. I nearly had a heart attack as I slammed closed the office door and hid in the back closet, calling 911. No one picked up. It was now 2.45 a.m. by that point, and I was sitting in the dark, cramped closet. I didn't dare leave. I couldn't hear much, but that's when I heard a shrill cry and a blood-curdling laughter. Come out. I heard the voice, and at that point that was all I could take. I sat down, and then I passed out, the darkness washing over me. It felt like seconds later that I woke up, and the early morning sun was shining through the windows of the theater. I freaked out and I looked around, but everything was fixed and normal. It was as though the whole night had been a dream, but to this day I swear it happened. But all I have is this recollection of it. The House Up on the Hill My parents had divorced when I was three years old, so on the weekends I would go to see my dad and he would stay at this house on my nan's property. It was a very steep hill to drive up and down. I always called it the house on the hill. I would tell my mom that it was super creepy to me and I didn't particularly like staying there. At the time of this story, my dad was remarried and I had a Boston Terrier named a Bucksweet. This is important later. 
So it was my dad's weekend and we were staying at the house up on the hill. I didn't want to stay so I asked if we could go somewhere else. He of course said no. We arrive at the house and mind you this house is old and looks like a house on stilts. Like the ones next to the ocean to keep the water from knocking it down. And it's just overall creepy. So when you get in there is a living room and straight across from the front door are the back doors that have very big windows right in the center. On the left, there is a hall that leads to my dad's and his new wife's room. If you keep going, the kitchen is there, with another door leading to a little patio. On the other side, the right, there is a gaming room with lots of windows. Down that same hall is a spare bathroom and my room. When you open the door, my bed would be there facing a very large window. In a little corner was an old TV hung up, a closet on the left, and another large window across that. Mind you, the window across my bed led to the front area to where I'm able to see who's driving in and out, and the distance from my window to the ground outside was at least 30 to 50 feet in length, so nobody or nothing could peek in the window. Or so I thought. It was time for me to go to bed now, so my dad put Alvin and the chipmunks on for me and put Buckswood in my room. It was probably around 8 or 9 when I fell asleep. Around 2.30 a.m. I woke up to Buckswood barking. A little mad, I said, Buck sweet, be quiet. No more than two minutes later, he was barking again, but louder. Wide awake now, I said, Buck sweet, what is? I was interrupted by a low growl. I look up at the window and saw what he was barking at. Mind you, it was a full moon, so it was pretty lit up. What I saw was horrifying, let alone to somebody of a young age. It was very skinny almost skeleton-like figure with horns that spiraled out at the tips. It had sharp teeth and beady red eyes that were almost glowing. Needless to say, I screamed and jumped out of bed. I was halfway down the hall, and then I realized I forgot the dog, so I ran back and called his name. He followed me, and we both ran down to my dad's room. He was already making his way down the hall because he had heard me scream. What's wrong? Are you okay? I was stuttering and I couldn't talk, so I just pointed and let out a whimper. What happened? Finally, I spit out. There was something in the window, and it growled. What? That's impossible. Apparently, he could see the pure fear in my face and went outside to go look and told me to go with my stepmom. He came back a few minutes later saying there was nothing there. Needless to say, I slept in between them and watched cartoons for the rest of the night. I still get terrified to go to sleep in that house but when I would have to. I don't go there anymore because of the incident. I would stay up watching YouTube videos until I fell asleep. That was one incident that chilled me to my bone. This story is true. It involves my immediate family and the house I grew up in, in a city in Connecticut. Before I was born, my parents were living with my older sister and brothers in an apartment in New Britain, Connecticut. They had become too large of a family for the apartment. My father decided the time was right to look for a new house. The year was 1978, and he had just gotten a promotion at his job, and the money allowed for a down payment on a colonial he found nearby. The house was built in 1920, and was very affordable. It had a large backyard, a finished walk-up attic, a large basement, and room enough for everyone. Now it was January 1979, when they finally moved in. The family settled in and my older brothers and sisters were happy with their rooms. One night, not long after moving in, the strange happening started. My father was laying in bed one night when he heard footsteps going up and down the staircase from the first floor living room to the second floor where the bedrooms were. He thought nothing of it because my sister at the time had been of a night owl at the age of 14 and would wander around at night. The funny part was that the footsteps, when they reached the top of the stairs, would stop at each door to each room and then go back down the stairs again. This seemed odd to my father, but he said that at the time he didn't feel like investigating, so he fell asleep. That same night, my mother awoke sometime after my father had fallen asleep. She too heard the sound of footsteps coming up the staircase and stopping at each door. She expected it to be one of the kids wandering around or perhaps looking for the bathroom or getting a drink of water. She looked toward the door to their bedroom and saw what she describes as a figure of a woman in blue. 
My mother described the sensation of being frozen and breaking out in a cold sweat. The figure spoke and said, Do you know where Margaret is? My mother couldn't answer. Before long, the figure ended up dissolving. My mother remembers nothing after that. She couldn't move or speak, so she couldn't answer the spirit's question. The next morning, my parents swapped stories. My father recounted the footsteps, and my mother told her much more disturbing story. A few weeks went by, and my mother was speaking with her father, my grandfather, and she told him her story. Being the type of man he was, hard-headed Polish, he told my mom the story was a bunch of baloney and probably was just a dream. That discussion they had is integral to what will happen later on. Strange things would happen in the house. Old shades would go up on their own. Footsteps, music in the attic with no known source. Pictures would come off the walls. Just things that would remind you that there may be a presence as you started to let your guard down. Sort of like a, hey, remember me? The most pronounced thing was the shadows out of the corner of our eyes. Now let's fast forward a couple of years to the night of September 30th, 1981. My parents were at the hospital because my mother was in labor with me. My grandparents were watching my siblings that night at the house. The same grandpa who had dismissed my mother's claims was asleep on the couch in the living room. Later that night, he awoke to the sound of what he calls the noise a dress makes when swaying. He looked up to see a woman in blue gliding across the living room and then up the staircase to the second floor. Again, frozen with fear and sweating. When he saw my mother in the hospital when they visited her and newborn me, he said one simple phrase and never spoke of it again until years later. He stooped down to her and said, I believe you now. That was it. Just those words. He recounted his story sometime later to her. We lived in that house for 17 more years. Strange things would always occur. The ghost, who we nicknamed Margaret, would let us know she was still there. We never felt threatened. In fact, I fondly remember that home as warm and welcoming and loving with a hint of added creepiness. Again, nothing demonic or harmful. Doors would open. Cats would hiss at nothing. We would see figures out of the corner of our eye darting up the stairs. The smell of cigar smoke would fill the living room, yet no one in her family smoked. Sometime before we moved, we got a knock on the door. A woman was standing there and said she was someone who had lived in the home. She was a daughter of the family my father bought the house from. She asked if she could see the house so as to revisit her childhood. My parents allowed it. While going through the house, she would touch doorways in a loving manner and tear up as she walked through the kitchen and the living room. After that, she sat with my parents for a cup of coffee, and she asked something that I always remember to this day. She said, By the way, have you seen her? Well, we all know who her was. Then the stories started coming out about her time in the house, and the visions of a woman in the attic window, as well as hearing footsteps. It was nice to have more verification, that's for sure. Anyways, thank you for listening and reading my story. I don't look back on these things with fear, but only with fondness and a good feeling inside. My parents are elderly now, and we still recount our time in that warm yet haunted home in New Britain, Connecticut. Hi everybody. The following story that I'm about to tell you really happened. Some might be skeptic about this, but that's alright. So was I. Even though it happened many years ago, I still can't believe it really did. A few weeks ago, it even happened again. Hopefully, there are more out there that have experienced this. First, a little background story. When it happened, I was about 11 years old. I lived in a small town in the Netherlands, Europe. The type of town where everybody knows each other, small enough to walk through in just 15 minutes from north to south. There weren't a lot of kids around during that time, so the few children living there were friends. One day, two friends, let me call them Frank and George, and myself were walking around bored. I can remember we wanted to do some innocent mischief, like prank calling, hitting the doorbell and running away, that type of mischief. But what could we do? George mentioned about the farming fields a few blocks away. He said that there were some beehives. For some stupid reason, we thought it would be funny to go there, hit them, and run away as fast as possible. 
To access those farming lands, we needed to walk over some plain grass field. The farming fields were separated from the grass fields by a small part of the forest. You could easily walk through it. It was just a matter of seconds. We all walked through the forest and came upon a sand path that would lead directly to the farming fields George wanted to go to. As we walked down the sand path, I noticed my shoelaces were untied. Frank and George, same age by the way, agreed to walk ahead. As I was doing that, I looked at the forest we just came out of. Picture a wall of trees. There was a small gap in the trees, kind of like a window, next to the huge gap where we walked through. As I looked at the small gap, I saw a man, dressed in all black with a white or light gray shirt. The only thing that scared me were his eyes. His eyes were bright green. No white, no pupil, just green. It looked like the sun reflected on his eyes, so bright as it was. I couldn't remember what happened after. Suddenly I got awoken by Frank. What's wrong, man? Wake up! He yelled. I snapped from the sort of dream I was in. Frank told me that when I took too long, he came to check it out. He saw me sitting there on the ground, looking lifeless to the forest. As I remember what happened, I looked back at the gap, but the man was gone. Now, I thought that was it. Frank and George never saw anyone, so I took it as a dream, forgot about it, and went on with my life. A few months later, I was playing at my friend's house. This time, it was my closer personal friend, Rick. Together with a brother, his brothers, friend and us two, we took some toy guns and decided to go to the forest, east of the town. Alongside a small river, there was one rarely used bridge. It connected a path to town. The river was alongside the forest. We decided to play war. Attackers have to go after the defenders of the bridge and take it over. Rick and I were the first attacking team. As we were hidden in the forest, looking at the bridge, we waited to attack. As we were doing so, I noticed something further down in the woods. Clear as day, my heart froze and my eyes were fixated on the moving creature a little bit of a ways from us. It was him. I couldn't believe it. The man in black, with a light shirt on. He was walking, moving, on such a crooked way, like his limbs were too long. Suddenly, he stopped. I held my breath, disregarding my friend that was with me. As if Rick wasn't there. The man turned his head so slowly. I could remember that I couldn't look away when he looked at me again with those shiny green eyes. But the worst was his mouth. Ever so slow as he turned his head, he formed a strange smile on his face. Not friendly, but hatred. When he stared at me like that, I couldn't deal with it anymore. I jumped out and ran to my friend's house. My friends following me back, not understanding what happened. I don't know how I explained later, but I don't know who I saw in two different times. Maybe it was a coincidence. I remember him as the green-eyed man. After that, I never saw him again, which made me conclude it was just a child memory slash fantasy. Like I said in the beginning, a few weeks ago it happened again. I'm 28 years old now, a full-grown man, mentally stable, clever. Why am I even saying this? Anyways, a few weeks ago, I was at the bus station in my town, different town than my childhood town, after a date with a girl. I took her to the bus station since I didn't have a car at the time. I didn't live too far away, so after she left, I walked home. It was dark, so I wanted to hurry up. Picture two streets next to each other, connected in the middle, like the letter H. I was walking on the left street, needed to go through the middle, and at the far end of the right street I lived. As I made the turn in the middle, I noticed something at the end. Under a dysfunctional, blinking street lantern, I saw a man standing there, motionless. Not thinking much about it, I continued my walk. Startled, but not seriously spooked. I was a few meters away from it until he slowly raised his head. I looked at the eyes. The same green, shiny eyes looked right at me. The same strangely crooked smile accompanied this, but this time it looked full of hate. He raised his hand and pointed at me. I booked it out of there. As I ran around the block back to my house, I checked the street. The street lantern was working fine. The green-eyed man was gone, and nowhere to be seen. That's my story. 
I don't know what I saw. Google didn't turn up any answers. Hopefully some of you have encountered this green-eyed man. I'll check the comments every day to see if somebody responded. Not that I'm scared or anything. I live every day like I always do. In the back of my mind, though, it's still a question. When will I encounter the green-eyed man again? For privacy reasons, the subscriber who shared this story with me would like to be referred to as T. Shout out to you, T. Thanks for sharing your story. Now, let's go over the unexplained and strange occurrences that have taken place in her life. We begin with some backstory. Five or six years ago, my ex-fiancé and I moved into a trailer park. I found myself working in the mornings. Meanwhile, my ex-fiancé worked at night. This meant I was often alone, save for the rare chance my ex had the night off. When choosing our trailer, I hadn't paid attention to the unsettling neighbor we would move next to. And when I say neighbor, I'm not referring to people. I'm talking exclusively about a cemetery that was located 800 feet away. The only reason I had no clue of its existence was due to the cemetery being built into the hill and our trailer park wasn't. Let's say, for example, you were on our street and looked at the hill. Well, you wouldn't be able to see the headstones from this street at all. In order to see them, you'd have to make your way to the entrance of the cemetery or stand next to the downslope of said cemetery. As for the headstones, there were some you couldn't even read as they were falling apart. Now, for the longest time, there have been people who would take pictures in the cemetery and shadow figures would appear in one of them. What's even crazier is that in the next photo, they're gone. Sorry for the backstory. I just want to give you some visual context. Anyways, we moved in the trailer and had to fix things up. Once that was done, we started to experience issues. The first interaction with the ghost, the unexplained I should mention, was when I was high. And yes, I know being high can affect the feelings and emotions. The difference here is that we had three people who were sober. In any case, both myself and my ex had the munchies. Thus, I went into the kitchen to make some pizza rolls. By the way, there is an island you had to walk around to get into the kitchen. While I'm in the front of the microwave, waiting on the pizza rolls, I heard someone whisper my first name, and it was just a lower whisper when I heard it. I immediately got a cold chill, as everyone I know calls me by my nickname, as my actual name is reserved for formal talking, or someone I just met. I went over to my friends and told them how terrible of a prank they had just pulled and that it wasn't funny. As you'd expect, everyone gave me a confused look and asked what prank I was speaking of. I began to retell the event and my ex said, Look babe, if you were in the kitchen, it would have taken how long for one of us to run from the kitchen, around the island, to the living room, and sit back on the couch? There were three sober guests made fun of me, but I just let it go even though it did bug me the rest of the evening. So that was just the first occurrence. The second interaction was when I was home alone with Molly and Ash. Molly is our pit slash lab mix dog, and Ash is our big boy, who was a gray short-haired tabby cat with the M mark on his forehead. Ash had the blinds open just enough for him to sunbathe on the back couch. Molly was laying on the carpet right in front of me, chewing on a bone. Now, both animals had just recently had a bath, thus neither one of them had on a collar. Our second bedroom had a twin bed for a guest if they stayed the evening. Sometimes Molly claimed the bed if nobody was home, or a guest wasn't staying the night. Remember, I can see both animals. All of a sudden, I hear Molly's collar begin to move around, sounding like she's adjusting it herself on the second bedroom bed to lay down. Then, I hear her collar jingle, like she had just jumped down from the bed, followed by the thud. Molly immediately stopped chewing her bone and looked down the hall with her head jerked sideways. I got major chills, and I almost threw up because I was so scared. The third interaction, I'm home alone again, and this time it was about 10 at night. My ex had just left for work 30 minutes prior. I was very exhausted myself. Now, this was late summer slash early fall, it was still 75 plus degrees outside. For those of you listening that live in a trailer, 
You know just as much as me how hot it can get in there. That was why I had our bedroom door closed with the AC going. Molly and Ash were both in here with me. Well, we were spooked when we heard three distinct claps coming from the corner of our bedroom that leads to the hallway. Molly was a medium-sized dog, roughly 60 pounds, so definitely not a little one who gets easily scared. She went to the corner of the bed and began growling, which got louder with each passing second. Even the hair on her back was standing straight up in a line. The growling then turned into barking, numb talking, really loud barking. I'm freaking out, ready to call the police, but I called my ex instead. He was able to calm Molly down and told me that if someone was in the trailer, let Molly go after them and grab the hockey stick and proceed to defend myself until cops arrived. Unfortunately, I'm shaking and feeling as if I can't move. I was that scared. My ex tells me, it's either you hunt or you become the hunted. Don't just let some random person scare you out of the house. Somehow, I managed to get out of bed and grab Molly by the collar, and then I proceeded to grab the hockey stick. Okay, Molly, when I open the door, go get him, but be safe. I whisper the command as I swing that door open. Molly takes off with a purpose, and I start to turn the lights on. Here's what's weird. I don't see anything at all. Door and windows are all locked. I check to see if the intruder was hiding somewhere in her home, but no luck. I didn't get any sleep that night, and work was an absolute nightmare. But that afternoon, my ex and I got into a heated argument. You see, anytime something paranormal happens, he always says I'm full of it and that I'm making it all up. He's the kind of person who doesn't believe in it, and since nothing has happened to him, he's almost certain I'm making up these stories. So, on to the fourth interaction that scared me so much, it caused an end to the relationship altogether, which saw me pack up and leave the next day. Yet again, I'm home alone and my ex is working overtime. It was roughly between 11pm and midnight. I'm there watching TV in our bedroom, and I had the TV on mute as I started to fall asleep. Out of nowhere, I hear someone knock three times on our front door. I can see our front door from our bedroom, by the way, and nobody was there. Then, there are three knocks on our window in the kitchen. Then, there are three knocks on our back door. I have my head covered under the blankets, by the way, and I'm crying attempting to call my ex, but I'm so full of tears, I can't see. Molly has her head sideways looking at the door, and all of a sudden she gets off the bed and begins approaching the door. I'm calling her back, and this was when I hear a loud clap come from the corner of the bedroom. It scared Molly, and she runs back to the bed, but she lays over me looking at the door and growling. I start praying, but then I remember everything going dark. I hadn't realized it, but from all the adrenaline and heart beating as fast as it did, I would passed out. That or the lack of sleep being unable to rest ever since we moved in. But there were nights my ex would shake me awake and ask why our bedroom door was open because it was letting out the cold air from the air conditioning, causing it to work harder. I told my ex what happened that night and we got into an even greater argument which led me to moving out as he called me crazy amongst all these other things. Side note, I did one of those salt rings around our trailer and prayed. But I think this might have angered whatever was in the trailer. That was after the second interaction. A lot of things happened between the ring and me moving out, such as cabinet doors being opened that were closed, or kitchen chairs being moved to a different spot. Even remote controls and jewelry would show up in different locations. And no, I don't sleepwalk, and my ex wasn't pranking me either. I don't know if this is the right place to tell this story, but here we go. This took place about 13 years ago. I was 11 at the time, and I was on a hike with my family. It was about 7, and it was getting dark, so we decided to go home. This is when I heard something in the woods and was wondering if it was an animal or something else. So I went out and started following the noise. I stopped hearing the noise eventually, so I decided to go back to my family realizing that I was alone and I had been lost. As I started following the path that me and my family were taking, I heard somebody 
singing. I couldn't make out what the song was, so again I started following the noise. The song was coming from this abandoned house deep in the woods. I went inside, and I heard a bang, and it repeated, bang, 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 and a lady was singing, all the bridges falling down, falling down, falling down. When I looked at the lady, noticing she was old, skinny, I'd probably say in her late 40s with half her hair ripped out, she started banging her head against the wall. So I took my flashlight out and shined it at her. She then turned her head to me and started screaming at the top of her lungs. And believe it or not, she actually grabbed me. I kicked her and ran off as she started chasing me. I didn't dare look back, but the screams got farther and farther away. Eventually, I slowed down to take a breath, and I saw a police car and ran towards it. This is where I saw my parents crying, so I told them about what happened, and I told them I got lost in the woods. I'm now 24 years old, and this is the first time I've ever talked about this incident. So this happened when I was 15 years old. For some background information, I'm female, and this happened at a time when a bunch of strange things were happening at our house, but those stories are for another time. To understand my story, you need to know how the layout of my house was. Walking in the front door, you see a hallway and stairs, and to the right was my living room where we were. I digress. It was a late summer night, and my boyfriend, who we're going to call Cisco, his sister Hazel, and my sister and I were up late watching movies. Cisco and I were cuddled up on one couch with me behind him, and my sister and his were laying across the floor. It was getting late and I was getting tired before I realized we were all asleep. It was the early morning now, around 5 a.m., still dark out, when Hazel wakes up. She then proceeds to wake up Cisco to leave home. He got off the couch, knelt down, and told me he was going to leave, taking Hazel home. Now, I was in that half-awake, half-asleep state, so I heard him close the door and his truck turn on and leave. Now, this is where it gets strange. I knew he was coming back, so when I heard the front door open again, I thought he had returned. But then, I thought, wow, that was fast. He was gone for only five minutes. He lives at least 15 minutes away from my house. Anyways, I heard footsteps get close to me, and I felt someone get on the couch with me. To understand better, I was laying down with my back towards the door and facing the couch. So when I felt him get on the couch, I didn't think to really check. He proceeds to wrap his arm around me like how we were sleeping before he left. With my eyes still closed, I put my arms on his, but I suddenly got this cold feeling on my back and got the chills. I had goosebumps literally running down my whole body. I asked him, Babe, why are you so cold? Next thing I knew, my arm was on fire, with three scratches going up and down, and now I'm not 100% sure what that thing said, but with his raspy voice, it whispered something like, I'm not him. I was so scared I couldn't move. The cold I felt on my back was gone, and my eyes were wide open. And I slowly turned to look behind me, but nothing. I then turned my head looking for what had been there, but also nothing. I did get up to go check outside, but none of my parents' cars were parked. So I went back to the couch and sat there stunned, deciding to call Cisco, asking if he had came by, but before I could call him, I had a text from him saying he was going to just stay home and get some rest. I got chills down my spine. Well, then who crawled on the couch with me? I woke my sister who was still asleep on the floor and asked her if she scratched me and was playing a cruel joke. Of course, she looked at me crazy after that. I explained what had happened and she said I probably had a bad dream and scratched myself. But it couldn't have been a dream. It was way too real. I felt it behind me. It had put its arm around me. I was so sure it wasn't a dream. And that voice. Still to this day, I can remember the rasp in his voice. Well, that's my story. And I hope it makes sense. This story happens when I was about 12 or 13. My best friend and I used to go to a place called Hanging Rock. We used to explore the cliffs and hike a lot. We also used to drive around on a lawnmower and it had a trailer which we put a recliner in. 
We used to drive around the town and take a drive down the campground that was never open. This particular evening, we drove down the road to the campground in the dark. My rider had lights so I could see well. Besides, the lights were very bright. I should mention earlier that day we had noticed by the far end of the campground fence, we noticed this fresh carcass of a rabbit. It looked like a large animal had been feeding on it. The animal tracks were quite unusual. Anyway, as we reached the entrance we would usually have to walk. The gate was open, so we drove right up to the shelter. It had an old deep freeze and no concrete slab under the shelter. It was just a roof with no walls, just big enough for a fire pit and a smokestack in the middle. We unloaded our firewood and we lit a fire. After a while of talking and eating our meal, we began to feel as if we were being watched. Not thinking much of it, we kept on talking. A few minutes go by and my friend says, Did you hear that? Sounds like footsteps on branches. I said, Yeah, that's kind of weird. The footsteps stopped and we looked towards the hill where they came from. I looked around and saw something move. I couldn't make out what it was, but could see the white shape of something big crouching. We stared at it for what seemed but like an eternity. Really, it was only a few minutes. Then it happened. It stood up. It had to have been over seven feet tall. As I looked at my friend, his eyes were enormous. He looked over at me and said, We have two choices. Get on the mower and get out of here, or wait for it to come get us. I replied, Let's go. We hopped on it with me driving and him in the recliner. As we sped away, we could hear it scream. We never did look back, and I should say the mower could only go about five miles an hour. The whole time, we could only think it could get to us if it wanted to. Needless to say, we did make it out of there. With our hearts pounding as we reached the lights on the top of the road, we looked back. It thankfully hadn't followed us. We were safe. We ended up staying at his house that night and decided to go back the next day. The area where the thing was had been trampled, and the branches of the trees had been torn off. There was another carcass of an animal where it had been crouching. My friend said, It must have been eating, and I'm glad it wasn't us. To this day, we laugh and talk about the time we could have been lunch. It was a scary moment we'll never forget. There was other strange sightings, but nothing like that we had experienced. I'm now 30, and I'm still scared to go back at night. I did my first year of college in a small city in southern New Mexico with a population of just over 100,000. At the time, my mother and I were living in my grandfather's house, which was a good 15-minute drive outside of the city. It wasn't too far, but the city was very contained, so when you hit the city edge, it was a good 15 minutes through the empty desert before you reached my granddad's house. This particular city has mountains that are very beautiful and unique that are about another 15 minute drive further into the desert from granddad's house. So one afternoon, I was driving up to the mountains to meet a friend for a hike. The road is dirt with twists and turns, and very badly washboarded. The turns and dips in the road make it impossible to see very far down the road, but if another vehicle is coming towards you, you'll know from the little dust cloud you'll see in the distance. So this day, I was about a third of the way down the dirt road when I came around a particularly large turn and I found myself nearly on top of a very large dog. The dog looked like an Australian Shepherd. It had that type of coloring. No tail though. It was just standing on the side of the road looking straight at me. Now, we were a good five plus miles away from a house in any direction. So I thought it was pretty weird to see a dog all alone way out here. Being a huge animal lover, I pulled over a little ways up the road and got out to try and find the dog. When I got out of my car, I was very surprised to find that the dog was now a fairly good ways off of the road and into the brush. How it had gotten that far that quickly and that quietly was beyond me. However, its gaze was still fixed intently on me. I walked towards the dog, thinking that most likely it was lost. Come here, puppy. It's okay. The dog waited until I got about halfway towards it before turning and running further into the desert. I followed after it. It's okay, sweetie, come here. The dog stopped and looked back at me over its shoulder. This start and stop went on for a little while, but every time the dog stopped, it would turn and make eye contact with me. 
while I continued to stumble and trudge through the rocks and brush towards it. This went on until finally it let me get close enough to see that its eyes were bright yellow. Yellow? I thought that it was a little weird. I blinked and shook my head, and then I realized I was supposed to be meeting my friend up in the mountain. I pulled my phone out of my pocket and saw that I was very nearly going to be late. I called the dog one last time, and again, it ignored me. Slightly disappointed, I turned to head back to my car and was very startled to see how far I had wandered into the desert. It took me a good 15 minutes to stumble through the desert back to my car. I stopped occasionally to look back, and every time I did, the dog was standing in the same spot, still watching me intently. When I finally reached my car and began to drive away, I happened to glance in the rearview mirror and was deeply startled to see that the dog was standing in the middle of the road, watching me drive away. And again, it was as if it was making eye contact with me. How the heck did the dog make it to the middle of the road that quickly and without me hearing it? It would have had to have run across the desert, and because there were no people this far out into the desert, the desert is so silent so I would have heard it. Anyways, by the time I made it down the road to the trailhead, I was deeply shaken by this whole encounter, but I was very happy to see my friend when he arrived. When I got home, I told my mom about the weird encounter with the dog. She didn't believe me, and she asked me to describe the dog. I did, and she asked if I was sure it wasn't a coyote. I insisted I was sure, and she said it sounded like it was a coyote and not to go following wild animals into the desert. About a week later, I had forgotten entirely about the weird experience with the dog. I was driving into town down one of the main roads into the community when I saw the dog. It was the same dog. I was positive, and it was standing on the shoulder on the opposite side of the road. This really freaked me out because we were a good 20 minutes by car from where we had seen the dog before. None of the other cars driving by seemed to notice the dog, or slowed down, which was also really weird because it was a very large dog, probably about 85 pounds. But what was really scary was when I was a good 100 yards away from the dog, I realized it was staring at my car. As I drove past it, its head moved to follow my car. As I drove away, I looked in my rearview mirror, and the dog continued to watch me. This happened again a couple of weeks later. Both times I told my mother, and both times she told me that it was probably just a coyote, not to read too much into it. About a month later, around Thanksgiving, my father flew in from New England to visit us. One night, I got up to use the restroom and wash my face before going to sleep. Now, my room was in the back of the house, and the bathroom was right by the front door. The front door was all the way at the end of the hall, in the front of the house. To get there, I had to walk past my parents' room. Now, even though it was only about 9 o'clock, my parents were in their room already asleep. I just rounded the corner and I was about 10 paces away from the bathroom when I heard and saw the door handle of the front door shake and jiggle as if someone on the other side was shaking it trying to get in. I froze for what felt like an eternity. It was only about a minute, but I couldn't move or think. Now, when you walk into my granddad's house, you walk right into the dining room. The side of the dining room has a ceiling to floor window that is right next to the front door. The window is actually two separate windows, a big, normal-sized one, and a short one underneath that that starts a couple of inches above the floor and only goes about a foot. Both of these windows have blinds, and on this night the blinds were closed on both. Very, very slowly I inched past the front door, turned on the porch light, and moved to the window. There was no noise now, but there was gravel all around the house. So if the person had moved or left, I would have heard them. Crouching down, I knelt so that I was face level with the lower window and held my breath, expecting to see someone's ankles. Ever so slowly, I lifted one of the blinds, and I peeked out. What I saw will forever be burned in my mind, and it still haunts my dreams. Standing on the doorstep was a black cat with huge yellow eyes, and it was right on the other side of the glass face to face with me, staring right into my eyes. I shrieked and fell backwards, dropping the blind, and ran half crying into my parents' bedroom. I dragged my mother, half asleep to the window and opened the blinds, but the cat was gone. I could tell that my mother still didn't fully believe me, 
How could a cat have reached the door handle to try and shake it? But the cat was the only thing outside. I know that I saw the doorknob shake, and I swear that the cat knew the exact spot where I was crouching and had its face against the glass and looking directly into my eyes when I opened the blinds. The most disturbing thing about this was that the cat and the dog from the side of the road had the same piercing, deep yellow eyes. I don't know what happened back then out in the desert, but creepy dog and scary dog, I hope I never see you again. My family and I had to sell our home that we lived in for 15 years. We eventually moved into our first apartment, as times were a little difficult back then. I'm not quite sure, but it was no more than two weeks we had moved in and were already settled. The apartment was a typical two-bedroom single house, and I remember being really excited to find it, as we had been looking for an apartment for quite some time. Enough about that. I won't bore you with the details. It started out as a typical day for my family, but a day that I would never forget. My husband left for work and I took my daughter to her kindergarten. After dropping her off, my three-year-old son and I returned home to start our daily routine. I was in the bedroom cleaning, also listening to him while he played loudly with his toys and ran around the house. I checked on him ever so often. Well, I heard silence for a few seconds and my son came into my room crying looking a bit shaken up. My first thought was maybe he saw a bug, or he fell, even though I never heard a thud. But before I got the chance to open my mouth to ask him what had happened, he said, Mom, there's a girl under the table. I sprang up and was taken aback because I was obviously sure that my daughter was at kindergarten and that there was no girl in the house, as I was and still am a very paranoid person. Now, I always locked the doors when my husband wasn't home, and the windows around the house had burglar proofing, so I was sure nobody was able to get in. Well, I walked down the corridor a bit curious, but certain that there's no girl in my home. My three-year-old son was walking closely behind me, by the way. I bent the corner to the dining room, stooping down, and I looked under the table, as I had expected, nobody was there. That thought was not the confusing or scary part. It's what happened after that sent chills that I still have to this day. I turned around expecting to see my son to be there, but he wasn't, so I exited the room and peered down the corridor to look for him. And there he was with a look of horror on his face. I tried to calm him down by telling him there was no girl under the table, but that only made him cry more. I mean, he was three years old, and the look on his face was a mix of pure scared and confusion. I held him by the hand, trying to get him into the room to prove to him that there was no girl but as I held his hands to bring him around the corner, he pulled away and shrieked with genuine fear. That's when I knew that my son had definitely saw something, and whatever it was, scared him to the bone, literally. As a mother myself, I wouldn't wish that any mother would ever have to see their child going through something so scary, not even being able to see or understand what they're experiencing. Even though it took some time, with me trying to convince him over and over that he can trust mommy and that the girl he saw was gone, he finally reluctantly peered around the wall that separated the corridor from the dining room, not even fully wanting to enter into the dining room. Thankfully, his facial expression told me that he also didn't see the girl, and as I looked at his innocent face, I could tell he was relieved, but still not 100% trusting to enter the dining room. It took a good week for him to be able to forget about what happened and to be able to go into that room by himself. As for me, I honestly would love to tell myself what he experienced was brought on by the overactive imagination of a three-year-old. But my mind also wanders off to what if it was something really supernatural. After that day, we never experienced anything like that again. The friends whom I've shared my story to believe that my son was too young to have made everything up and to have faked his reaction, and they tell me I should have an open mind. I really would prefer not to believe that a ghost could be in my house, because the possibility definitely freaks me out. We don't live there anymore, and my son is now 10 years old, and thankfully, he doesn't remember this experience. But I can tell you that I would never forget that day, for as long as I live.
I had an experience that I have shared only with my parents and very close family friends. I've been summoning the courage to tell the full detailed story for a year and a half now. Here it goes. At the time, I was a 15 year old boy and I had played with an Ouija board before with no avail. Usually I ended up with my friends sliding it around and just messing with a girl or somebody who didn't know we were joking. I recently moved from one part of town to the other, which I liked more because I had more friends at my new high school. We ended up buying a large house for mainly security reasons, and we wanted something more private and better security in a safe part of town. The house is Victorian style, and like I said, it's very big. My dad left with my mom to treat her to a beach vacation on her birthday, and my other siblings are all gone, spending the weekend at a friend's house. I asked my mom if I could have three of my friends to stay at the house since they all lived in apartments, and I couldn't stay with them due to the size and their parents. She said yes, so we all hung out at my place. It was a Saturday night, and we watched the Dodgers game on TV, and as we ate food, Colby said he had brought his Ouija board. I was pumped up that the basement had a big room that was unfinished. We had some boxes down there, but that was the best place as it was just all around creepy. We also had a laundry chute that fell down there too. Davis and Ty wanted to go to this room, so we all hustled down the stairs and got setting up in the room. We placed the Ouija board down and we started the session. Is anybody there? Colby asked first. The planchette stood still when it slowly slid to yes. This didn't surprise me or anybody else, as we figured it was just the other person doing it. The laughing, I asked if they were a boy or a girl. The planchette moved to yes. This was dumb, and I said, guys, if you're going to screw with it, make it believable. Ty said it wasn't me, then Davis, and Colby. But in the middle of Colby speaking, it slid with ease, spelling out there are two. Come on, you guys, this isn't funny anymore, I said as my hair stood on my neck. Davis was stuttering this out. Colby, you better stop. Colby was usually the troublemaker and the one that we thought that was messing with us, but he was as pale as Ty. Say goodbye, dude. Say goodbye, Ty chimed in on the verge of crying. Colby ended up asking, what's your name? It ended up spelling out, leave. Ty was done. He was petrified. Davis said, what do you want? It spelled out not important. And Ty was now done. He was practically screaming, Dude, just end it. It then ended up spelling out without us asking a question. But listen, we all went quiet. This inhumane feeling suddenly took over. And this is when we heard a woman yelling upstairs repeatedly, Look, look, look. The planchette was now shaking, and the laundry chute door was banging. There was definitely something in the room. At this moment, I definitely felt as if everybody was crying, and I heard wailing like a banshee. Look, she was screaming from everywhere, and the planchette rattled on the board. I had enough, so I screamed a goodbye, but the planchette wouldn't move. I cried to God, please, just stop, take this away. I thought I was going to pass out, as it just got louder. Colby was screaming sounds an animal could not make. He was in the fetal position. I was the only person holding the planchette now. I screamed, leave me alone. The planchette slid in circles going to the moon on the board as I grabbed it and said, goodbye. My eyes were closed now. The screaming was now getting quiet and the board still rattled. Ty had gotten up now. As we were all sweating and tired, we broke the board and we swore it off. I ended up sleeping at Davis's house that night, too scared to go to mine. I sometimes at night feel breathing through my sheets and on me. I have these dreams of that room completely empty except for a coffin in the middle. I'm still scared when I'm writing this out to you. Anybody thinking about playing with an Ouija board? Please take my advice. Don't do it. This story takes place in the year 1993. I was a sophomore in high school. I must emphasize the importance of this year as cell phones, internet, and effortless forms of mass communication at your fingertips was non-existent. There are ample amounts of backstory, but I cannot get into it and I feel this story is the only way I can safely tell it. You'll understand why as the story goes on. At this time in my life, 
My friends and I were very carelessly using an Ouija board that I found in my deceased great uncle's attic after he passed away. Again, I won't go into many details here other than it was wooden, old, and had no instructions. We took it home and my sisters and I along with my friends began to play with it. Weeks went by and so did a few months and a lot of stuff happened in my house with my friends. Me strongly being a believer in the paranormal didn't question much of what was happening as it was witnessed not just by myself but many others. I saw such occurrences change the beliefs of skeptics in a matter of moments. I was horrified most of the time sleeping with my lights always on or never alone. At times, I was even amused by it. We'll use the term it here as I can and will not call it by its name. Then came a day in early spring of 1993 that my friends and I were sitting at a round table in the library of our high school. The topic always seemed to circle back around what was happening in my house. There were four of us sitting at the table. Myself, Monica, Kim, and Suzanne. I was beginning to get a little agitated, and I began to feel arrogant. So arrogant that I said aloud to my friends almost these exact words. If you're so powerful, and so real, then you wouldn't be stuck in my house. So show us a sign you can hear us beyond there and the board. And just like that, the lights went out in the entire library and school for about five seconds. When they came back on, I continued my overconfident banter by laughing and saying aloud, Really? That's all you have? The bell rang shortly after, and it was time to go home. I didn't think much of the incident after, but knew my egotistical faked act may have some consequences down the line. That night when I fell asleep, I had a dream. I'm not even sure I can call it that. I can't even call it a nightmare either because it just feels so unreal. This was one of those dreams, or visions if you may, that you wake up from and feel it. You can even recite every line in detail as if you were still in it. To this day, I can still feel the resonation and remember every bit. The dream starts off in the morning as I begin to walk into school from this street. I'm immediately plagued with a sense of horror and a sense that I was slowly being chased. There was a procession of black hooded figures, fully cloaked, no signs of human life underneath, just a human form. There were six of them, all with their heads down. It was broad daylight, by the way, and they were each carrying a torch. In the middle of them was a very tall figure, again all in black, with a red stripe in front of his cloak. He was not carrying a torch, but rather a long, pewter staff of some sort. This is when I stopped studying the details of who it was. I knew who it was, and I knew they were after me. Especially him. By the way, they weren't running or in any type of haste. The procession was slow and methodical. I remember running into school fast and frantically began to look for a hiding spot in the library, as that's where my dream put me. I quickly jumped over those bookshelves which were low to the ground, both in dream world and in real world, and balled up on a shelf hiding and praying not to be found. I then woke up, breathless. I said few words as I got ready for school and onto the bus that morning. None of my friends involved in the library situation or the Ouija stuff in general, were on the same bus route. I dared not speak a word to it to the kids I rode with on the bus, as most of them I despised. When I arrived at school, finding my friends Monica and Kim waiting for me at the north entrance, as they did every morning, I began to tell them the details of the dream. We had just entered the main hallway as I was finishing the dream details, when running from the south entrance was a very pretty good distance from us, Suzanne. I didn't feel I needed to drive home to the point that there were no cell phones and no conceivable ways for Suzanne getting any of this information. This is exactly as it happened. It's 100% accurate. Trying as hard as she could to catch her breath, she looked at me and said, I have a message from you. From him. Not it, I must emphasize. Tell Nicole she can't run, but she can't hide. To this day, every time I tell this story, I envision him laughing and still saying, I found you. So there are two parts. The first part is from what my friends told me about their experience at this place, and the second part was when I went with them the second time. So again, a bit of backstory and layout. This place is called Proctor Valley Road. 
Apart from it being right near the border of the U.S. and Mexico, it's a well-known spot for drug cartel activity and Norse patrol patrolling. There are a lot of fun stories with it. This is some sort of minotaur-like creature that eats people. A ghost lady who flags down your car and asks for a ride and ends up killing you whether you give her a ride or not. A demon car that is really only headlights that'll chase you through not to do anything really. And then just some other random occurrences. It starts out on one end from a series of empty back streets, then just turns into a totally void and empty really bumpy dirt road. It goes on for miles and abruptly ends on a very nice paved road near a housing development. So the first time we were going to go, I was not feeling great and cancelled, but my friends went anyway. But this is what they told me about what went on. On their drive through there, they suddenly saw headlights approaching fast. Of course, their first thought was the demon car, but what freaked them out is that all they could see were the headlights. Now, again, middle of nowhere dirt road and it's pitch black. The car had its brights on, so it makes sense that the car might be a black car or something that they couldn't see. It was tailgating them for a while, and you can't drive fast on this road unless maybe you have a good off-road vehicle. So they just stayed calm, and finally the car swerved around them and went past them. Again, they couldn't see a car at all. They saw the headlights and taillights. No plates or anything. Just the lights. What could it have been? Who knows, but they were pretty shaken up about it. So about a week later, we decided to go again. I had to see this place for myself. So again, we drove down there and end up in the back roads and thinning out neighborhoods. This is when suddenly we hit the first road. And here we are. It's super bumpy, and we have no choice really but to crawl along at about 10 to 15 miles an hour to avoid any damage to the car, or worse, ourselves. Now, once we get onto the road, my friend's girlfriend just bursts into tears. She starts hyperventilating and freaking out. For some reason, she's just scared out of her mind, and she won't talk to us, and she's just crying. Now, she's a very tough person, intimidating really. She's not the kind of person to just get scared or back down from anything easily. Not now. She was reduced to nothing but tears, sobs, and gasps for breath. Our other friend was in the back with her and was doing his best to comfort her, and my friend driving just got us out of there as fast as he could. About halfway back, I suddenly had this horrible feeling of anxiety, like something wasn't right at all. My friend's girlfriend was still crying hysterically. My friend frantically just looked annoyed and wanted to leave. At one point, I remember we were having trouble getting up a hill and not getting great traction. My friend put the car in park and was saying he was going to get out and see if he could get us some traction. By this point, not only was his girlfriend still crying, but now I was having a horrible gut feeling. Something wasn't right, and I almost felt like something was watching us. Not someone, but something. I felt this unnatural presence, and I was freaked out. I told my friend to just stay in the car and keep trying, and eventually we did get moving. Finally, we ended up seeing the light ahead of that neighborhood I mentioned earlier, and I felt relief. As soon as we were back on the regular road, my friend's girlfriend calmed down, but still wouldn't say anything the rest of the ride. I used to think it would be fun to go back there, but over time and more, I think about it and remember that awful feeling I had and how my friend's girlfriend reacted. I'd say it's better to leave it alone. The cartels can have their own fun for all I care. Anyways, whatever I experienced was nothing to really do with them. Again, this is just something very, entirely unnatural. And if anybody else has had a similar experience, I would love to hear it. Hi there. This is a story of a time I'm positive I saw a UFO or multiple of them, when I was on holiday, vacation for the American viewers. This was in the late summer of 2017. That day of August 2017 was like any other British summer's day. Sun in the sky, a slight breeze in the air. Well, it wouldn't be a complete British summer's day without a drop of rain. Any British person would tell you that. Let's cut to the chase. We got to the caravan site at around noon. The caravan site was surrounded with acres of fields, full of wheat, barley, crops, and other types of plants and vegetation farmers profit on. Also, I forgot to mention there was an airfield about half a mile away. The caravan site was on top of a hill. 
Not too steep, but steep. If you like sightseeing and views, this would be the ideal place for you. As I said, we were on a hill. That resulted in us being able to view the whole town, which was about two miles away. You had a clear view of the sea also. You could not beat that view. It was that awesome. That's what I meant when I said it'd be perfect for sightseers. That night was when I saw it. Now, it was pretty nice that night weather-wise. There were only a few clouds in the sky, and it wasn't raining, just a slight breeze. I myself was sitting down at the bottom end of the caravan, and I looked out the window when I was horrified to see lights above a ginormous cloud. Not just one. There were about four or five of them up there. They were moving at incredible speeds nothing on this planet could achieve. I was debating whether it was a concert of some sort in the area that was causing the strange lights in the sky. There were no beams. Nothing. Not a single thing. These things were each dimming every five seconds or so, each at different times. These things stayed there for a good hour or so. It was now about 10 p.m. and I was sleepy as heck after the long journey. Thus, I was paying more attention to laying my head on a pillow rather than the paranormal. The subject came back in my head while I was in that half-awake slash half-asleep state, so I looked out of the window one last time. I examined the sky for any things out of the ordinary, and to my surprise, they were gone. Not only that, the cloud they were hiding behind had also gone. As I said, this cloud was huge, very huge. My point being is that a cloud of that size couldn't move that quickly. Could this phenomena be the cause of the crop circles in the area that have occurred over the years? Maybe. Was it something to do with the local airfield? Could be. All I can say that it was the most creepy and weird experience in my life to this day. By the way, the rest of the holiday went without a hit. Everything went normal. Also, the fish and chips were very good. First off, some background information. I live in a suburban area, so it's typically quiet. My friend and I have known each other for a long time now, going on nine years. Let's call her Summer. Just recently, I moved into a small apartment, and Summer has been the witness on many accounts of the eerie events occurring here. Anyways, when I was about 13 years old, my parents and I went to go pick up Summer so we could have a sleepover. About halfway there, she called me panicking, saying there was a man standing across the street, staring back at her. He had a tall, eerie stature and remained in the shadows. By this time, she ran inside because he began whistling and oddly shuffling toward her. Summer was urging me to hurry up to get her, and her mom was dead asleep, so she was no help. Thankfully, I got to her, and I saw no sign of the figure. I did take her back to my place, and we did enjoy the rest of our night eventually forgetting about the whole thing. Anywho, us being teenagers, we decided to take a midnight dip in the pool. I forgot to mention, but my other friend Hannah was there. Everything was fun and games, until we heard a faint whistling. It came in two tones. One, a medium pitch, and the next one sounded a bit lower. It was the kind of whistle that can send chills down your spine. We all froze. Summer tried her best not to cry, Whilst I and Hannah stood there deciding whether we should run for it, we wait. Nothing. Eerie silence filled the cold air. Yet we continue cautiously playing around, looking about the area every so often. Then, we all saw it. I instantly get the chills. A tall, dark figure stood there, staring back at all of us. Now at this moment, Hannah was underwater. So I yanked her up by the arm as she took a surprise gasp of air. I told her quietly, we should go, and we booked it out of there. We ran so fast to where the ground seemed to go in slow motion, and I didn't want to stop. Eventually, we got inside and we calmed down, but we couldn't stop talking about it. And you know that awkward silence you sometimes have with your friends, when you stop your conversation because you have to find something new to say? Well, that happened to us, and just as Hannah opened her mouth to speak, we heard it, the faint whistle. A few moments later, my mom peeped her head in the room, and she said while glaring at me, Was that you? No, I said, shaking, chills all over. To this day, I haven't figured out the cause or the meaning of these events. 
but I hope I never see that shadow man or hear that whistle ever again. I really don't know how to start this story off, but I'll try my best. So I was 16 when this happened and my mom had just left to go to a banquet she was invited to. I didn't want to attend since I knew nobody who was attending the banquet. Besides, some of the teachers who I didn't really feel like talking to were going. And also, I don't like big crowds. So my mom let me stay home, but not knowing how long she was going to be gone kind of did worry me, but I never did complain. Now let's get into the scary part of this story. My mom had been gone for around 30 minutes before the start of this happening. I was sitting in the living room watching YouTube videos on our TV. Then nature started calling, and I went to the bathroom. At some point, my mom had told me that one of my cousins was coming over to get something and wouldn't be staying long. Now, our bathroom door is really thin, so you could basically hear anything happening in the hallway, and sometimes in the living room since the bathroom is the closest room to the living room. After shutting off the faucet, the TV had shut off. I knew this because I had it blasting minutes before, since I wanted to listen to it while I was in the bathroom. Thinking that my cousin had came in and shut the TV off, I was pretty mad. After waiting a couple of seconds, I stormed out of the bathroom, ready to sarcastically accuse my cousin of turning the TV off. But guess what? When I was in the living room, nobody. So I checked the kitchen. No one. We live on a one-story house. No basement or anywhere someone could really go to hide away from someone, and you couldn't get into the attic without going to get a ladder. And besides, we didn't even own a ladder. I checked all the rooms in her house, even the closets in the backyard, but there was no one. Feeling a little creeped out, I just blow it off and went back into the living room, turning the TV back on before heading back into the kitchen, putting on some popcorn and standing by the microwave, waiting for it to be done. Then, the TV shut off again. Kind of annoyed, I stormed into the living room, with the most accusing voice I could muster up, I shouted. I was watching that, believing that my cousin was pulling a trick on me. But there was no one. I jumped lightly when the microwave starts going off, slinking back into the kitchen to retrieve my popcorn. After I had retrieved my popcorn, I had returned to my spot on the couch in the living room, deciding I wouldn't get up to look for anyone or anything. I would let them play their game and not get caught, forcing them to reveal themselves since I wasn't going to hunt them down. To this day, noises still happen in my house, but that's a story for another day. Hi mate, I'm a big fan and have a few stories to share, but I never find a time to do it, so today I'm making that time. This was a few years ago, I was about 16 years old at the time. My family and I moved around a lot, it always took me a little while to feel comfortable and settle into a new place. This particular home we moved into backed onto a large bush area. I am Australian, so I guess you'd say forest area. Anyway, I was in the backyard later one afternoon when I noticed this one lady from next door was out in her backyard with her golden retriever. We say hello to each other, and we have some small talk too, but all of a sudden, we hear a loud growling type noise that sent shivers down my spine and gave me goosebumps. I looked towards the bush and I noticed a lot of birds fleeing and squawking like they were spooked too. I have to admit, it startled me and I looked at the old woman who also looked scared and said to me, it's because of that noise that I don't come out into the yard without my dog. We both walk backwards towards our homes and we go inside. I try to tell my family, but of course they think it's just my imagination. A little time goes by and my sisters and I decide to do some bushwalking and explore the area behind our house. We found a track and follow it around, and at first we thought it was just birds chirping and kookaburus laughing, and then we decide to explore deeper. We've been walking for about 30 minutes, when suddenly I realize it's quiet. There are no animal noises anymore and now it feels like we're being watched. It's at this realization I told my sisters that mom would be waiting for us to help with dinner, so we better get home, and so we decided to make a game of it, and I told my sisters that we should have a race home. We ran all the way back. Feeling exhausted, 
but feeling safer seeing Ma there. I should have mentioned that our house was a two-story home. My family all lived upstairs. My bedroom was downstairs. But to get to my room, I had to go out the back door and access it via the garage back door. One night at about a week later, I start walking down the back stairs. That's when I see the plants rustling around, which was just at the back of our back stairs. I'm startled, and I stop. I slowly started to walk backwards up the stairs, and I don't take my eyes off the spot where I saw the plants rustle. They rustle again, and I call out to my ma. Mom! She comes running out, and I told her what's happened. She thinks it's just my imagination, but grabs a knife and her torch. We did go down the stairs and look. And there's nothing there, but what we did notice is that there was a large flat area in the middle of the plants, as if someone or something was sitting there. She tells me it's probably just a dog and tells me to go to bed. I lock the door to the garage, and then I make sure the windows were also locked, before I lock my bedroom door as well. I have trouble going to sleep that night, and the next few nights following that too. Then one night I couldn't settle, and I'm rolling back and forth, and this is when I hear a noise outside my bedroom window. At first I didn't think anything of it. I thought it might be a dog or a cat, but I couldn't help myself. I glanced out the window. What I saw still scares me now thinking back on it. It was dark and I couldn't make out a shape, but I could see the eyes that were watching me. They were red. I was so scared that I couldn't scream and I couldn't speak. It just stared at me and I was just looking at it. Suddenly I found some courage to look away, and when I looked back, thankfully I noticed that the window was locked. I noticed now the eyes following me, and that's when it crouched down out of sight. I quickly ran to my bedroom door to make sure it was still locked. Thankfully it was. I jammed my closet door against the door, so I felt safe. I did eventually fall asleep. About a year after we moved there, the developers started building new homes in that bush. The more homes that were built, the less creepy it felt, and all the weirdness stopped. I never found out what it was, but I was glad that my neighbors also experienced something too, or I might have thought I was crazy. Hello, I have a creepy story I'd like to share with you, that you might like to share on your channel. Okay, so I'm female. I was 18 at the time attending community college full-time. I've always been super shy my whole life, so I suck at making friends. But this guy in my art class was super nice to me, and we decided to kick it. We would skip classes all the time, go for creepy drives, and explore some shallow wooded areas. For some stupid reason, one day we decided, hey, let's play with an Ouija board. But not just any Ouija board. Let's make our own. So we left class and went to a consignment shop in our downtown to see if we could find some sort of antique wooden surface to create this on. We ended up finding an old, like really, really old wooden briefcase. We ended up buying and went to my friend's house to work on it. We took it apart and used one of the sides to turn it into an Ouija board. We weren't the greatest creative masterminds, so we decided to draw the Ouija on there with just Sharpies. I remember thinking, yeah. Sharpies on wood? Real scary. It came out pretty mediocre. I remember that. For some reason, we decided to go to Walmart. Now, this was over five years ago, so I can't remember exactly why, but it probably had to do with touching up on the Ouija board, because we tossed it in the trunk and went on our way. We were at a stop sign close to the Walmart, and it was my turn to go. The turn is a little weird. You have to take a right and then an immediate left. So I took the first right, and when I took the left, my car spun out of control. It had never done this before. It had passed inspection. I had no idea what happened. I just remember screaming. It had rained hours earlier, so the weather was still gloomy. But there was definitely no puddles for my car to slip on. My car had spun out, and we ended up on the other side of the road, where cars would be coming out of the street that I was going into. I was so startled I couldn't even cry. My friend was in the passenger seat and just laughed. I got so mad. If a car had been there waiting to turn out of the street I spun out on, I would have hit him. Or the passenger side would have hit him too. I could have killed my friend in the passenger seat and the driver of the other car. Anyway, we definitely lucked out. 
When I got back on the road to go to Walmart, we got there and I just remember having this heavy feeling of dread, like I just wanted to leave so badly. I didn't want to work on an Ouija board. I didn't want to look at this kid. I wanted to go home. I asked my friend to leave, still surprised at his lack of concern at almost freaking dying. So we start on our way back and I drop him off. I try to get him to take the Ouija board with him because I was just super creeped out at this point, but he insisted that I leave it in my car to work on it next time. I went along with it. He got out of my car, we said goodbye, and he shut the passenger door. I start driving off, and I hear this horribly loud rattling coming from my car. I started panicking. I know nothing about cars. I later found out I had broken the strut. The loud rattling started causing my car to shake slightly. My car was an early 2000s build, so it wasn't the newest, but it got me to school and work every day with no issues prior to this. I decided that stupid Ouija board creeped me out too much to hold on to. What's the coincidence that my strut would break after I spun out? How? Was it him closing the car door? How? I decided to toss the Ouija board out at the nearest gas station trash. I'm not one to believe in paranormal things at all. I'm more of the boat of, I'd rather just not take the chance. I don't want to know the truth, basically. Unfortunately, my car problems didn't stop there. My car kept having problems two weeks after following that. The engine would stop at every stop sign and red light I would come to, so I would have to turn my car off and on all the time. The strut did get fixed and immediately broke again. My car would shake violently after that. Luckily, I ended up scrapping it for 300 bucks and got a new car. I haven't had any bad luck yet, but you best believe I'm not going near any Ouija boards or creepy old antique items for that matter. Ever. Growing up, I've always spent the summers of my youth escaping to my family beach house in Dennis, Massachusetts, a small beach town on Cape Cod. During the summer of 2012, my friend Ben tagged along. It was a beautiful summer night with no moonlight or clouds. Leaving the sky illuminated with stars, it was around 11 p.m. when we decided to take advantage of the amazing night and chill at the beach where we could sneak a couple of blue ribbons under the night sky and possibly toss a line in the water. We arrived at the beach and parked ourselves in our wooden chairs, and were sharing a conversation, when moments later a perfectly round reddish-orange spear appeared on the horizon over the Nantucket Sound. At first I thought it was a star, but then Ben said, Do you see that? I replied with, Yeah, I was just about to say the same thing. We said this in astonishment, going further to say it looked like a UFO. However, we just laughed and neither of us took our own claim seriously. Then the orb rose higher up and moved to the right in a perfect line. I said to Ben, That's kind of weird. Don't you think that's a strange pattern for something to be flying? Seconds later, another orb appeared from the same spot, following the exact same flight pattern. Then I put my head down to light a cigarette when Ben said, Look, there's another one. Amazed, I looked up at the sky. Now there were three orbs that followed the same path over the horizon, and now they were hovering in a straight line for a few minutes, until one by one they blasted off into the night sky to leave our vision. Of course, once we returned to the house, nobody believed what we saw, and they tried to brush it off. To this day, myself and my buddy believe we saw something from out of this world. Seven years later, spending many more summer nights in the exact location on that beach, I have yet to see anything like that again. I love listening to your videos and everyone's stories, especially at night. I felt I would share one of my stories if that's okay. I live in East Sussex, England, and when I was younger, around 13 or 14 years old, my parents bought a piece of land on the Ashdown Forest. It was around four acres. My dad is a builder, so we got planning permission to build a few stables tack room, and barn. We had a few horses, and being able to hack out onto the forest was excellent. I had so much fun being out and about, just me and Jellybean, the name of my horse. Anyway, my dad had laid down the foundation with cement for the barn. We came back the next day, and he had spotted a paw print in the cement. This was no average dog, cat, badger, or fox paw print. This was massive. The pad was the size of the palm of my hand with the claw indents. 
My dad then told me that there have been sightings of big cats on the forest, and this would be it. I was really worried as we had our horses here plus chickens. What if we came in one morning to find them in scraps? One weekend, me and a few friends were down the yard with our dogs. At the time, we had two Jack Russell Terriers, Disney and Dara. They used to go running into the forest trees. Oh, I forgot to mention that at the bottom, on the next door neighbor's field, was a large area of trees. This is where the dogs used to run around. Our neighbors didn't mind. We were doing our usual chores, such as sweeping, and all of a sudden, Disney was dragging a deer's front leg up the hill with the assistance of Dara. Now, I don't know about you, but this really creeped us out, and I started not to really feel safe up in that yard. My mind started thinking of an explanation. I tried to calm myself in thinking that the deer died of natural causes, and maybe a fox had shredded it apart and the dogs just found it and brought it back. But then I started to think about this big cat, that it lives close by, and the dogs took its dinner. Going forward a few months, not much really happens, but my dad said he spotted something in the neighboring field that looked very much like a big cat. He described it as being tanned in color, almost matching the color as the long grass. We decided to have a gathering with a group of friends one day. We set up a fire near the bottom of our field. Now it was getting dark, so we left the yard lights on so we could see our way back a bit better. We had split the field so the horses couldn't bother us or go near the fire when it was lit. We were playing games and having fun when I noticed the horses were going a bit mad, running around and snorting. So I went over to check up on them to see if I could calm them down. I walked up the hill and ended up near the top by the yard. The horses were looking down the field at the clump of trees in the neighboring field. This is where I saw two glinting eyes. I froze for a good two minutes. I didn't know what to do. I walked slowly down the hill toward the eyes. I don't know what I was thinking when I just stood there staring at it. I could hear it breathing. I was a meter away from the fence, and I growled at it. I know, really dumb. I continued to growl, and this is when it growled back. Shivers ran down my spine, and the only thought I had was stay close to the fire. Wild animals don't like fire. The others saw me walking backwards toward them and wondered what I was doing. I told them what had just happened, and we decided to call it a day. We put the fire out and swiftly went home. And that was the time I encountered the big cat of Ashdown Forest. I also wanted to say that if you do read this out, a massive thanks in advance.